Welcome everybody to our panel di discussion today about the 2019 novel coronavirus or COVID-19. My name is Georgie Pipkin. I'm the Director of Communications for Baptist Health and I'll serve as your moderator today. We're going to ask our experts here a series of questions. If you have individual questions that you would like to ask, we will break out for sound bites as needed afterwards. Um, so this will run about 30 minutes or so and then we can break out for those individual interviews. Look for our Baptist Health staff and they'll help you navigate to the appropriate expert. Um, without further ado, thank you, our experts here today, um, for being here and for joining us on this topic and lending your expertise to us. Dr. Braden, um, Dr. John Braden specializes in emergency medicine. He's our Baptist Health Medical Director for Emergency Preparedness. Dr. Perez Fernandez is a pulmonologist and he's our Critical Care Director at Baptist Hospital of Miami. He diagnoses and treats patients who suffer from respiratory or breathing issues. Dr. Marty Eileen Marty is a professor of infectious diseases at Florida International University. And Dr. David Mishkin is emergency preparedness, um, emergency medicine physician and our medical director for Care on Demand, which is our telehealth platform. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and start. Dr. Braden, I'd like to start with you. If you can kind of walk us through what Baptist Health is doing to prepare for a potential spread of COVID-19. Thank you. Um, I've been the uh, medical director for emergency preparedness. The organization takes emergency preparedness very seriously. Uh, I've been in this role for about 12 years and through various threats, H1, Zika, dengue and uh, Ebola that really uh, ramped up our efforts to prepare for these types of things. And um, we um, take our role in the community very seriously um, as far as being prepared for situations like this. Um, we um, uh, have a cross-functional team of professionals that assist with training, protective equipment, uh, protocols for uh, managing patients and the inpatient side. And these help us uh, respond effectively and, sh and ensure consistency uh, across the organization. Uh, currently our task force has been active and been um, preparing for several weeks uh, for this event. So what should people do if they believe they possibly have contracted COVID-19? What are some things that, that we're advising folks in the community? Well, primarily um, the symptoms are going to be fever and a respiratory illness such as cough. And so they should be uh, reaching out to their uh, health care provider to see what advice is given and what the best uh, mode of action is. Um, if symptoms are serious, you should seek medical attention immediately. Um, we're looking at this um, patient population as, as serious or not so serious, <coughs> and we're uh, advising them uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but overall, most cases of the COVID-19 are mild um, fever and respiratory symptoms. So I'm sure a lot of us, you know, have um, group chats, text messages, family members, friends that are asking about it. If they believe that, you know, they have potentially um, something and they come to us, what are we advising? How are we handling potential cases that are coming to our facilities? Well, Baptist Health across our entities have a screening process uh, at the entry points, including the ER and urgent care facilities for pneumonia-like symptoms and particularly fever and respiratory complaints. Um, once we identify that, they're moved to a uh, triage area uh, where an in-depth uh, interview for travel history will take place. Um, and we will ad identify and isolate patients um, that um, meet criteria for that. And then with guidance from the CDC and the health department, um, we look at uh, managing any potential cases. You mentioned travel a little bit. So if we can expand on that just a bit. So if there's a person maybe without symptoms but has traveled to an affected area, um, what should they do? We would uh, be happy to interview them. Um, if they don't have symptoms, um, that's where we have been uh, making use of our telehealth uh, partners and uh, Dr. Mishkin can speak to that. Okay, great. So Dr. Mishkin, we'll get to you in a minute and, and talk more in depth about our telehealth platform. 
Dr. Braden, um, just to wrap up a little bit on your piece, I would I want you to talk about the protocol for patients who potentially are confirmed. And I should mention that right now there are no confirmed cases at any Baptist Health facility right now. Um, but potentially, what is our protocol or what, what do we have in place for patients who potentially are confirmed in the future? Um, that's correct. Uh, potentially confirmed because the confirmation process right now does take some time. Um, but we do have patients under investigation, and that's where we coordinate with the health department. Um, after we go through the travel checklist, their symptoms, we relay that, relay that to the health department, uh, and we, in a collaborative effort, look at whether they will be considered for testing. And we obtain the samples, send them to the health department when they deem that they are a patient that should be tested. I know um, Dr. Marty will get into this also, but could you kind of briefly talk us through what's the best way to protect yourself? Um, the best way in the general public to protect yourself, um, because this is a droplet-borne disease, um, it's by contact with objects that someone else has touched. Um, and that is primarily the biggest way <coughs> of transmission. Doorknobs, railings, uh, things of that nature. Um, the masks in the general public actually provide little help. Uh, they're primarily useful in the hospital setting where you're in very close contact with patients that are found to have illnesses um, of many sorts. Um, but in the general public, um, there is very little droplets that are in the air because they settle rather quickly and don't spread more than six feet. Um, and these are in um, conjunction with the CDC guidelines. So hand sanitizers, gloves, washing your hands uh, for 20 seconds is really the best way to help slow the spread of this. Thank you, Dr. Braden. Um, Dr. Paris Fernandez, I'm, I wanna ask you a few things. We understand that COVID-19 can present with pneumonia-like symptoms. You know, that's your area of expertise. Can you tell us a little bit about who are maybe the, the folks who are most vulnerable um, and walk us through some of the folks that maybe are at, at higher risk? Sure, thank you, Jordi. Uh, good morning, everybody. I think uh, it's important to mention and echo the words that Dr. Braden had said, uh, though the this virus behaves with respiratory symptoms. Most of the patients suffer very mild symptoms on the respiratory condition. So the vast majority of the patients that are affected with the COVID-19 are only presented with cough and fever. And, and the respiratory symptoms don't go over that. For those patients who develop pneumonia, which is a condition that will fill your lungs with uh, inflammatory substances, such as uh, some fluid and some bacteria or virus in this case, those patients might be affected in different degrees of severity. And most of them, very luckily, have been behaving also with mild to moderate disease. So they don't become uh, what we call uh, respiratory dependent or dependent on any uh, particular supply or, or sustainability. So they are recovering and they're recovering well. Now, when those patients, the ones that really have more chances to develop a problem are those who have been affected with comorbid diseases. And what we call comorbid diseases, we speak about conditions such as respiratory baseline conditions such as COPD or, or, or even complicated asthma cases or patients who have other uh, diseases such as diabetes or, or even cancer or recovering from lung cancer. Those are uh, the population that we call at risk and that we've seen based on, on the experience that we have with the COVID-19, those are the ones that really can or are exposed to more complications. Excellent, thank you. And for the Spanish media who's in the room, um, we'll loop back around with Dr. Perez Fernandez and, and go through this in Spanish as well. Um, Dr. Marty, thank you for being with us and, and joining us here today, um, our partner at Florida International University. Can you talk to us about some of those specific symptoms that are linked to COVID-19? Thank you, Dory. Yes, and first I want to thank Baptist Hospital, and I'm so pleased with your outstanding preparations and plans for this very serious uh, situation that we all find ourselves in. So you asked specifically about signs and symptoms. 
um, Dr. Perez Fernandez and Dr. Braden are correct, 80 percent of the cases that we have seen are either mild or moderate. And by mild, we're talking about someone who may have a, a fever, may have uh, the, the sense of un being unwell, we call that malaise, we have muscle aches, and we have a dry cough, not a productive cough generally, but a dry cough. And so the, that's your mild cases. Your more, uh, more moderate cases, which fit into that 80 percent of, of individuals, have what we consider like a walking pneumonia. Not the type of pneumonia that lays you flat, but the type of pneumonia where you're just that much more uh, un uncomfortable and you start to have this sensation of a shortness of breath. Following that, we have uh, about 13.8 to 14 percent of the people who present with severe disease. These are people with much more notable pulmonary symptoms. They have, um, many of them develop a, a condition that we call ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And those are harder to treat, and those are the people who require hospitalization. Then the last collection of patients, about 7 percent, a little bit less than that, present as critical. And these individuals not only have these serious respiratory problems, but they also may manifest um, multi-organ failure, particularly problems in the kidneys and liver, and that is uh, a serious condition and, and much harder to treat than the severe cases. There are other symptoms that we see in individual patients that are less frequent than the ones I've mentioned. Some people will have headache, some people will have nausea, some people will have vomiting. Very, very, very rarely do we see people who have any kind of a runny nose. That's really not a feature of this particular disease. So we, we have to think of this more as a, uh, a respiratory disease that has a certain degree of gravity. Yesterday, the head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Titus, uh, expressed that the current overall world fatality rate for this is about 3 percent, a little bit over 3 percent. And that's significantly higher than the numbers we're seeing before. But we have to bear in mind how each country is doing their testing. Throughout many parts of the world right now, China included, Germany included, the testing has been to test every single possible case, period. In the United States, up until last week, we were not test, we had no protocol for testing community acquired cases and had to beg the CDC for permission to do that. They changed their protocols and they allowed us to start testing, but only the severe and critical cases. Because of that, it looked like the U.S. had a 7 percent fatality rate. We do not. The truth is we have many cases that are in that mild area. Thank goodness yesterday, finally, towards the evening, the federal government has authorized clinicians who, based on the signs and symptoms and travel history of the individual, and whether or not they have any connection to any other COVID-19 case, if they present as a COVID-19 case, we can now do testing on those individuals. That will radically change, and yes, it will seem frightening because we're going to have higher numbers. But that doesn't mean that the situation in terms of its risk has changed at all. What it means is that we're being realistic and therefore that we're going to be confronting this in a much more realistic fashion. Moreover, it enables us to finally be able to do appropriate contact tracing and containment of this outbreak, which is the best solution that this world has for what is, in effect, a common human enemy. Regardless of where we're from or who we are, this is a common human enemy. Moreover, if I may say one more thing, uh, the rate of risk for this absolutely increases with age. People 18 years old and younger have, have constituted less than 2.4 percent of all cases worldwide. Infants, those under a year old, have not needed mechanical ventilation, have not needed care in a, in a pediatric intensive care unit. They have done remarkably well. We have not even seen any deaths in that age range. The, the, the seriousness goes up as we get older. 
to the point that someone 80 years old, depending on which study you look at, has and has no other comorbidities, has a risk of death between 14.8 and 21 percent simply for being that age. We here in South Florida have an aging community. We have a lot of people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and so we have to be particularly attuned to that reality. Thank you, Dr. Marty, um, for that. We also kind of want to learn, you've traveled the world and, and uh, been through Ebola and, and lots of other things. Can you share with us some best practices for protecting yourself? Um, tell us, you know, the face mask, do, do we need a face mask, do we not? Share some of those, that insight, that would be great. Well, first, again, let me congratulate Dr. Perez Fernandez and Dr. Braden because the information they already gave you is correct. Let me add to their, to their information and say that it is very important that we be hygienic. This, the good news about this virus is that it has an envelope and envelope viruses are more sensitive to most any cleaning uh, ingredients that we can use, most any uh, easy over the shelf. Uh, so by cleaning surfaces and keeping surfaces that are frequently touched clean, we're going to reduce spread. That's very, very important. Uh, number two, we have to do personal hygiene. And by personal hygiene, I don't just mean washing your hands, although that is incredibly important. I mean being attuned to what you're doing with your hands on a regular basis. Because if you wash your hands, then touch a contaminated surface, and then touch your face, you've basically defeated the purpose of having washed your hand. So you have to be attuned to what you are doing physically with each and every moment, really, if we want to reduce your risk. And that includes that it's time for a little bit of social distancing, something that we say every year about influenza and something that, unfortunately, people don't pay as much attention to as they should. So do the fist bump. Do the elbow bump. Don't do the handshakes. Seriously, it's not a time for shaking hands. That's just a brilliant way of communicating not only this virus, but many others. The other thing are practical things, very practical things. We know there are things that we do that increase our, or decrease our own body's ability to combat any infectious disease. So let's do those things that make us less susceptible to this virus. What is that? Eat healthy, nutritious foods in appropriate quantities. Not too much, not too little. Exercise every day. If your knees can tolerate it, take the stairs. Don't take the elevator. Walk, uh, park your car further away. Get those steps in. That's important. The next thing is get a good night's sleep. Sleep rejuvenates your body and enhances your immune system tremendously. Those are the things that increase your immune system. Things that decrease your immune system that you want to avoid include things like smoking. Smoking damages the ciliary cells of your respiratory system and makes it, if you, if you smoke, it's harder to get rid of any pathogen that's in your airways. What else should you not do? Try and uh, not stress yourself because any stressful situation at all, whether it's an argument with your loved one or uh, maybe riding uh, an airplane might be stressful for you. Those sorts of activities increase your cortisol levels, and as they do that, they decrease your immunity. So don't do that if that's stressful to you. Uh, or counter that by doing meditation. Do the kinds of things that reduce your stress. That's very important. Do the kinds of things that enhance your immunity. That's very important. And be mindful of the people around you. Yes, it's true that if you're a 20-year-old female, your risks of, of from this disease, if you get it, are very low because the, high, the males have a higher risk than females. We've established that. And, um, and we also know that the older you are, the better. But you're going to be a potential source for people who don't have your age, your gender, or your state of high immunity. So be mindful of the people around you. So social distancing is also very important. Thank you, Dr. Marty. Great insight and great advice there. We're going to shift over to Dr. Mishkin, um, who is our medical director for Care on Demand. Um, Care on Demand is a telehealth app that Baptist Health has on your phone where you can essentially visit a doctor 24-7. So 
What should people know about care on demand, especially if they're concerned about cold-like symptoms, um, which could be treated for, you know, COVID-19? Are we seeing um, people using the telehealth platform, and what insight can you give us? Thank you all. Good morning, Georgie. Um, so, we all are aware th um, that telemedicine is a um, alternative to seek care without having to, um, you know, physically go into a doctor's office, um, an urgent care center, or a hospital. At the current moment, um, we recognize that a lot of patients um, with certain symptoms are specifically concerned whether or not they are, um, were exposed to this virus. And so our telehealth platform specifically um, is undergoing um, you know, an approach where we want to be accessible to the community to advise patients um, and their family members um, about their symptoms and potentially what to do next. As um, Dr. Braden and um, even Dr. Marty just mentioned, the first thing that many um, patients are asked um, by someone after they expose symptoms is, is go talk to your healthcare provider. And for a lot of patients, there is potential access to do that, but for many, there are not. And so we feel that for telemedicine, this is a great alternative for patients to seek care with our providers <coughs> who have been trained and are following surveillance guidelines and CDC protocols to advise patients on next steps. In addition, many patients are also concerned about other conditions they're experiencing and potentially putting themselves in harmful environments to treat things that may not be related to this um, current virus. And we want our patients also to use our telehealth platform to seek care specifically for those issues um, to reduce exposure and potentially not to get more critical so we can be, have a handle on those issues as well. Thank you, Dr. Michigan. You mentioned um, the health department and the CDC. So are we kind of connected in terms of our telehealth platform with those um, official authorities from, from health department and CDC? Very much so. Our providers um, are trained to basically give information that is in accordance with the current CDC and Department of Health guidelines. We are updating this daily and we're in communication with our team to make sure we're giving the community the best advice per all these recommendations. Um, we want our patients to use this platform because we know it's safe, it reduces their exposure, and will give them an opportunity to, to relieve that you know, potential fear and anxiety that they may have without having to um, do something that may not be um, in their best interest by going to a facility or um, going and, or delaying care. And so those are the types of um, things that we really want to educate the community on right now with the use of telemedicine. Thank you, Dr. Mishkin. We have a few questions coming in from our Facebook Live viewers, but if we can take a moment, um, Dr. Paris Fernandez, and, and summarize, no pressure, uh, a little bit of the information um, that we're talking about here today in Spanish, that would be great. Sure. So, voy a cambiar al lenguaje español y, y vamos a resumir un poco lo que mis colegas han dicho. En primer lugar, tranquilizar, el mensaje de tranquilidad hacia la población. Eh, la enfermedad, el COVID-19, es un virus nuevo, es un virus novedoso, eh, sin embargo, es un virus que se está comportando de una manera eh, leve a moderada. La mayoría de los pacientes, la doctora Martín ha mencionado, 80% de los pacientes o incluso más, se están comportando de manera leve y moderada. Los síntomas más frecuentes de la enfermedad son problemas respiratorios, fiebre, la presencia de mialgias, dolores musculares que se afectan, y esto ocurre en la mayoría de los casos. La afectación pulmonar, la respiratoria, la gravedad de la neumonía es en muy pocos casos y viene asociada a enfermedades eh, como enfermedades crónicas del tipo de la EPOC, la enfermedad pulmonar crónica, la enfermedad renal, eh, la presencia de cánceres asociados y también las personas de edad más avanzada. Estas son las personas que tienen más riesgo. Muy importante mencionar eh, que el sistema de salud Baptist, el Baptist Hospital, el sistema de salud Baptist, tiene unos protocolos muy estrictos que seguimos de acuerdo a las recomendaciones de los centros de control de enfermedades infecciosas, así como del Departamento de Salud del Estado de la Florida. Y estamos siempre en contacto en esta condición que es evolutiva y que va cambiando día a día, como ustedes saben, y están viendo, obviamente, en los propios medios de comunicación. Entonces, es muy importante mantenerse siempre al día. Algo novedoso, o en cierta manera, eh, también eh, muy adecuado para la población es nuestro sistema de que llamamos Care on Demand. Care on Demand es un sistema en el cual el paciente tiene la oportunidad de entrar a, a dialogar con nuestro sistema de salud, con nuestros profesionales de la salud y preguntar aquellas dudas que tengan que ver 
con la enfermedad y tener contacto con un profesional de la salud sin tener que venir directamente a nosotros. De acuerdo, muy importante. Y luego, finalmente, también resumir cómo protegernos de la mejor manera posible ante esta enfermedad. Y la mejor protección es las medidas personales de higiene. La doctora Martín las ha nombrado muy bien y las ha resumido muy bien. Va más allá que lavarse las manos, va con los cambios de hábitos. El tratar de, de mantener una distancia eh, de seguridad quizá no es lo más amigable en nuestra condición, ¿verdad? Que entendemos, pero es lo más necesario en este momento y no tomarlo como algo rudo, sino como algo protector y algo adecuado. Tratar de evitar el, 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 el apretón de manos y saludarnos de alguna manera cordial, pero sin tener necesariamente que llegar al contacto físico, lavarnos las manos, por supuesto, proteger a aquellas personas que puedan ser eh, objeto de contagio, aquellas personas que vengan de zonas de riesgo, que presenten síntomas. Y la doctora Martina ha dicho algo muy importante para nuestra comunidad. Esta enfermedad nos afecta a todos. No tiene que ver ni con raza, ni con edad, ni con color. Tiene que ver con una realidad. Nos puede afectar a todos y, por tanto, hay que, en toda manera, protegernos, pero también ser cordiales y amigables, ¿verdad? Y es muy importante, de nuevo, este nivel de protección. Si una persona está enferma, vamos a proteger al resto de las personas alrededor. Eh, eh, de nuevo, el higiene, la higiene de manos es muy importante. El uso de la mascarita, como ustedes saben, está siendo solamente indicado para las personas que están enfermas para no exponer a los demás. Y para nosotros, los profesionales de la salud, que tenemos contacto con muchas otras personas. La mascarita, de otra manera, pues no tiene una, un, un papel adecuado en la protección. Y yo creo que más o menos ese sería, de nuevo, un mensaje de tranquilidad. Algo importante es que la cantidad de pruebas que se van a hacer en los próximos días en los Estados Unidos van a aumentar. Ha habido un nuevo cambio en los protocolos de investigación de esta enfermedad. Y es posible que veamos un aumento en el número de casos reportados, lo cual no implica necesariamente que la enfermedad se ha hecho mucho más común, sino simplemente que estamos averiguando más y que esa averiguación lo único que implica es un mayor número de casos leves, leves a moderados, que es la mayoría, y le decimos la inmensa mayoría de los casos que pueden ser observados y tratados en el propio hogar sin necesidad de ir a ningún centro de salud, ni estar admitidos, ni mucho menos estar a riesgo en su vida. Gracias, doctor. Muy buen hecho. Um, Dr. Braden, if we could go back to you, we're getting some questions on, on Facebook. One question is, is, can anybody who's concerned get a test? The um, short answer is they can be evaluated for testing. Uh, whether the health department uh, okays it uh, will be on their end. Uh, we have the appropriate swabbing materials and uh, the guidelines and the checklist, um, and that is what we go through when we get a patient. Another question is about our volunteers, our nurses, our clinical staff um, here at our Baptist Health Hospitals. How are they being protected? Um, each person's job dictates what type of protection um, will be necessary. Um, in the non-clinical areas, um, the risk is low, and so we're promoting hand hygiene in those areas. Um, if you have direct patient contact, then we have three levels of personal protective equipment that is used uh, based on your proximity to the patient and what clinical procedures you would be doing with that patient. Great. And last question here um, for Dr. Perez Fernandez, just to kind of reiterate some of what we've discussed already. If someone's presenting with mild symptoms, a dry cough, but they don't have a fever, what should they do? Well, again, it goes into the different protocols that we have for diagnosis and testing. Dr. Braden had mentioned some of them. We follow, again, this is a very evolving condition. We learn and we change some of the protocols on, I wouldn't say on a daily basis, but frequently, and so we have to be tuned on that. I can tell you our emergency preparedness system is, is, is definitely a model uh, to follow, and I, and I really congratulate Dr. Braden on that and taking the opportunity to do that. But uh, we, we are always on top of, of making decisions about when to test people or not, as he mentioned. So, so the, the adequacy of a test depends on, on the risk that you have to have the disease. In this case, there are specific criteria Again, there are some of them are published by the, the health department, some of them by the Centers of Disease Control, CDC, and, and even the World Health Organization has also uh, some advices about that. So if you really think that you could have the disease, you need to contact your healthcare professional. And Dr. Miskin mentioned that. There are many ways to do it. 
We have care on demand as an option. We, we also have, obviously, different professionals available. We have the ED departments, the urgent care centers, and, and multiple other routes of, of uh, contact your healthcare professional. If your healthcare professional, uh, following those strict criteria that we have, consider that it's appropriate for you to be tested, then we'll do it. And they will initiate the protection uh, uh, or the different protocols that are established to protect you and your others uh, regarding the possible transmission of the disease. Thank you. Dr. Braden, I'll give you the last word here before we break out, and we will have time for individual interviews once we conclude the panel discussion. Any final thoughts, um, key messaging here that we should take with us while we kind of go into the community? Um, any last final insight that you can give us? Um, the um, uh, best thing is to remain calm. Um, the hospitals are prepared for this, uh, not just ours, but the others in the city, um, they have all been in contact with the health department. The health department has been very helpful in providing us information, giving us guidance, uh, and keeping us updated on that. The um, uh, process has been um, an up uh, evolving, and we're uh, working to stay as up to date as possible with that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Braden. Thank you, Dr. Perez Fernandez. Thank you, Dr. Marty and Dr. Mishkin. We really appreciate your time. We'll take just a one minute break and we're going to do individual questions. No, we'll do because some people want English and Spanish. So we'll break up these tables really quick if you guys don't mind standing and we'll do individual questions as needed. Let's work with our team and we'll direct you to the appropriate expert. So if we can quickly move these tables.